Hello. Hello, hello. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Programmable Cryptography Conference. We're super excited that all of you are joining us today. My topic for this talk is going to be an introduction to programmable cryptography. And uh, I'm going to be touching on some of the themes that we're going to be seeing throughout the next two days. So first, a little bit of an intro. Um, I'm Gubsheep. I've been working on applications of cryptography for the past four years. Uh, the first two years with the Ethereum Foundation, and more recently in the past two years as a co-founder of ZeroX Park, the program for applied research in cryptography. I'm going to start off with a bold claim, which is that we are currently in the midst of a generational transition between what I think about as first-generation cryptography and second-generation cryptography. First-generation cryptography generally refers to things like encryption and signatures, which probably all of us in this room are familiar with. We usually associate first-generation cryptography with words like privacy or security, or oftentimes with ideas that have a little bit more of an even ideological bent, such as like an anti-authoritarian impulse to keep your coins safe from the government. Today, we already use first-generation cryptography pretty much every day in our daily lives without thinking twice. Think things like any time you connect to a website over HTTPS in the browser, um, whenever you use a password manager or an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging service like Signal or Skiff. But my claim is that even though we use cryptography on a daily basis and it affects every facet of our lives, the possible impact of cryptography today is still just a fraction of what second generation or programmable cryptography is likely to create. So let's talk about second generation cryptography or programmable cryptography. In the last five to 10 years, we've gained a new set of capabilities, which allow us to move from proofs for specific functions to proofs for any arbitrary function. Cryptography now gives us the power to, instead of verifying only specific claims, being able to verify any claim that can be expressed mathematically. And we move from special purpose protocols to general purpose cryptography compilers. Special purpose protocols are protocols where in order to serve a specific cryptographic operation or to include a specific kind of cryptographic function inside of a system that you're building requires you to go to a specialist or a cryptographer in order to invent you a new math, write you a new paper, um, and, and add that to your arsenal. But with these general purpose cryptography compilers like ZK Snarks, we can have developers and application builders specify the internal logic of the systems that they want to build in language that's accessible to the rest of us, and then automatically compile these things down into protocols with cryptographic hardness. This allows us to build much more powerful tools with those kinds of affordances. So in many ways, our cryptographic capabilities have moved from being alarm clock-like, where you might have specific hardware that can carry out one specific function, to being CPU-like, where again, these things are programmable, they're much more flexible, we can reach much higher levels of complexity with the same guarantees. So with this transition, we're also seeing a move back to the origins of cryptography even as a space. This takes us back to cryptography's academic and intellectual uh, ancestors, uh, information theory. So the Claude Shannon Mathematical Theory of Communication paper was published almost exactly 75 years ago, and it was really the grandfather kicking off a lot of what we think of today as cryptography and information theory. Programmable cryptography, far from just being about security, privacy, or similar kinds of words, is about computation and data and the operations that we can perform on them. It has the potential to affect every aspect of how we think about digital communication. So, by show of hands, how many people in this room have watched the movie Oppenheimer? Cool, so that's actually most of the room. Um, so, I got the opportunity to watch Oppenheimer over the summer, and one thing that I found really fascinating was the kind of narrative that it laid out for the development of technology over time. And one thing that I kind of took away from this was that, you know, in the development of a new technology or a deep technology over the course of many decades, you can kind of break the life cycle down into several distinct phases. You know, in the first phase, there's the discovery of a new scientific or technological primitive, such as, you know, we can split the atom. Um, it takes a couple of years to actually go from that, even if this is an obviously powerful thing, you know, 
splitting the atom, the theory of computation, a science for information, to actually understanding what you can really do with that. So, you know, I can split the atom, there's effectively infinite energy everywhere in the world, but there's still some thought work that I need to do in order to figure out, well, maybe that thing allows me to, the first thing I might build with that is an infinite power source or a bomb. Are we building an infinite power source or are we building a bomb? And then finally, there's the phase of technology which is engineering and actually carrying out the plan. How do we build a nuclear power plant? How do we build a nuclear bomb? This might seem kind of straightforward for a technology like nuclear power or nuclear energy, but there are many technologies where it is far from obvious how you go from one stage to another. You know, another example that's very contemporary to uh, the Manhattan Project is the development of the theory of computation. Once you figure out that basically all procedures in the world can be represented in this kind of universal way, how do you actually go from that to figuring out what you can do with that on a civilization or a society scale? Are computers going to be tools of governments, universities, and large authorities, or are computers a tool of personal liberation? You know, the idea of the personal computer and the, the microcomputer revolution. So those three stages are approximately how I'm going to break out this talk. First, I'm going to talk about what programmable cryptography is, what is this new set of capabilities that we've developed, and lay out a simplified tech tree. In the second part, I'm going to talk about the affordances of programmable cryptography, uh, what you can actually do with it now that you have this magical power. And finally, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the trends that we've been observing in the pathway or the trajectory to actually realize the full possibilities of programmable cryptography. So let's start off with the tech tree. So this is a simple diagram that I made a couple of months ago that for the computer scientists in the room or those who have uh, maybe taken a complexity course is, can be thought of as like a reductions diagram. So in other words, if you have a node up on the higher levels of the tree that you have access to, you also, or the DAG that you have access to, you also have access to all the subsequent lower nodes that feed into it. So if I have ZK snarks, uh, it is trivial to make a digital signature scheme. If I have fully homomorphic encryption, then I have an encryption scheme. And you can sort of see at the very top, at the very edge of this, you have indistinguishability obfuscation, which is like the granddaddy of all these, of these technologies on the screen here. And of course, this is very, very incomplete. Now, what you'll notice is that some of these boxes have their text bolded, and those bolded text boxes are what I think about as programmable cryptography. So this is the cryptography tech tree. We mostly know how to do the unbolded stuff. We're figuring out the bolded stuff right now. Okay, so let's go through a couple of these branches one by one just to give a feel for what programmable cryptography feels like. So let's start off with ZK Snark. That's probably the example in the room that um, the most people here are familiar with. And let's look in particular at identity claims and how the ability to make identity claims has evolved with cryptography over time. So one claim that we've known how to do for about 50 years and which is really widespread today is the claim, I know a private key corresponding to Alice's public key. We have public key uh, cryptography systems that allow us to make and prove these sorts of claims. Um, they're widely deployed, and uh, in general, this is what is securing a lot of our digital communications today. Shortly after the development of public key cryptography, um, folks started working on other kinds of claims. For example, I know a private key corresponding to one of Alice, Bob, or Charlie's public keys. Now, uh, some folks came together and came up with some very clever mathematics that allow you to prove claims like this, um, and these are generally called group or ring signatures. We figured out how to do these, but we haven't totally deployed them at scale. Those are specific protocols that might, requ might require some specific math or specific key generation algorithms, um, but in general, we know how to do these. Slightly harder than this is you know, what happens when you try to introduce new kinds of properties or like one new bit of functionality at a time to these procedures. So you might have a claim like, I know a private key corresponding to one of Alice, Bob, or Charlie's public keys, and the other two can or can't prove that they did not generate this message. So if I am not, oh, sorry, if I am someone who is in the set, in the identity set that this group signature was generated for, maybe I can disavow the message after it's been posted if I'm not the actual signer. So again, every time you want to flip one of these bits or add one of these functions, you have to go to a cryptographer, they invent you some new math, probably it doesn't work with your old keys, um, and it becomes very challenging to, to increase steadily more and more functionality. And then finally we get to stuff like, you know, a claim of arbitrary complexity, like I know a private key corresponding to one of Alice, Bob, or Charlie's public keys, 
and I either possess a signed attestation from one of David, Eve, Fred, Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, whatever, or during the Ethereum block that had header X, I knew private keys that controlled accounts that collectively um, owned at least 32 ETH, or I possess some biometric that when run through a neural hash, um, hashes to some fingerprint hash with a certain property, and then, you know, et cetera, et cetera, more and more binary predicates. And, you know, I would think that if you go to any cryptographer today and ask them to build you a special purpose protocol for this kind of a claim, they'd probably look at you like you're crazy. But this is exactly the kind of thing that programmable cryptography, specifically ZK Snarks today, allow us to do. ZK Snarks turn math problems into programming tasks. Like Vitalik mentioned, what this process now looks like is you take someone at the application level, they specify the internal logic of their system in a human readable specification language, and now we have a cryptographic meta compiler that turns that into a protocol. Okay, so that's ZK Snarks. Um, let's talk about multi-party computation, in particular two-party computation. This is another branch of the tree. So this branch I'm going to motivate with the following observation. ZK snarks are really powerful, um, but they only allow you to make proofs about private state that a single person knows. So I can evaluate arbitrary functions on secret inputs that I know and prove that I've evaluated them properly. Um, but what I can't do is perform joint computations over secrets that are distributed over multiple people. So to give a toy example of a place where ZK snarks fall short, you can imagine the kind of operation in, let's say, you know, a decentralized game or something, where I might have a sword with some secret stats, and you have a shield with some secret defense stats, and I attack you, and we're trying to jointly figure out, without revealing to each other or to the world, what the outcome of that battle action is. ZK snarks are not enough for this, because ZK snarks only allowed you to make proofs about private state that a single person knows. Multi-party computation would be the tool for the job here. Now, we've had two-party computation slash multi-party computation protocols historically. For example, um, a famous example is the millionaires problem, where you have two millionaires, Alice and Bob, who are trying to figure out who has the higher net worth without revealing to each other anything more than the outcome of that fact. But this two-party computation problem requires a very specific protocol. You know, some very smart people came together a few decades ago and figured out a precise sequence of interactions for this particular 2PC problem that allow Alice and Bob to interactively figure this out. What we'd really like is we'd like to have two-party computation protocols that allow you to do this for any uh, function f that's sort of specified maybe at runtime even. So that's exactly where the direction of things is headed. Um, we're starting to see increasingly general two-party computation and multi-party computation protocols, and we're going to hear later from Barry Whitehat about the things that you can do with them. Um, and that's another example of going from special purpose to general purpose and the unlock and complexity that that enables. Okay, so I'm going to breeze through the remaining uh, three kind of bolded uh, notes here. The first is FHE. FHE is like encryption, but while encryption typically destroys the structure of what you're encrypting in hiding it so that you can't perform computations on it, fully homomorphic encryption allows you to encrypt data and then perform computations uh, on that encrypted data. We've got witness encryption, which is an even further out kind of primitive, uh, which allows you to encrypt statements not with keys or with passwords, as we can do today, but with programs. So for example, I could encrypt a secret message with a Sudoku puzzle. And the result of this would be that the only way to decrypt this message is to provide an accepting input into this program. In other words, providing a Sudoku solution. And this allows us much greater flexibility and programmability with the predicates that we use to hide information or make it accessible. And then finally, we've got sort of the, the granddaddy of this whole tree, indistinguishability obfuscation, which um, is sort of the holy grail of at least where a lot of programmable cryptography framed in this way is going. And one very approximate way to think about the thing that you can do with indistinguishability obfuscation is that you can encrypt programs. So I can take a program and I can scramble it into a black box that can hold its own secrets, whose source code is not trivially inspectable uh, to anyone who's observing. Uh, this black box is, is, a, is a construct that anyone observing would only have input-output access to. And that's a very powerful primitive that sort of generalizes uh, many of the other things that we've just discussed. 
Okay, so now that we have a feeling for what kinds of technologies make up programmable cryptography, let's talk about what we can do with it. Now, I expect that this is a question that's gonna take us years, even decades, to figure out, but I think it's worth doing some thinking up front. And in my head, um, you know, what we're really trying to get at here is if we're making this claim that first generation cryptography is around a relatively narrow set of affordances that have to do with things like security and privacy, but second generation cryptography takes cryptography back to its information theoretic heritage and allows us to just be talking about computation and data, then we ought to have some sort of, you know, more specific ideas for how that might actually manifest. So I want to share two kind of ideas or frameworks that I have for thinking about the sorts of things you can do with programmable cryptography. And my first example is a phrase that I'll, I'll call programmable protocols. So this is motivated by the following general problem. There's two people on the internet, and the one person wants to ask the other person for some sort of information. Um, this is obviously an extraordinarily broad problem. It's arguably the reason why the internet exists. Uh, it informs the design of all APIs. And if programmable cryptography uh, can have a big impact on this, it's probably safe to say that programmable cryptography is a pretty important digital technology. Okay, so first I'm gonna show a very simplified diagram for how the internet works today. This is a very simplified diagram of the OAuth protocol. So you've got the person on the right, uh, person on the left. Person on the right might ask the person on the left, are you Gubsheep? The way I currently respond to that is I might go to Mr. Zuck and I might be like, Mr. Zuck, please respond for me. And Mr. Zuck might go like, yep, he's Gubsheep. Okay, let's take a slightly more complicated request for information. Person on the right might be a financial service provider, someone I'm applying uh, for to, uh, to for a loan. They might ask, what's your credit score? And I might say, Equifax, please respond for me. And Equifax will go and like gather all my personal data from a bunch of these data sources and silos and say his credit score is 740. And great, now the person on the right knows. And both of these are sort of, you know, <clears throat> specific cases of this general instance of problem where the person on the right says, given an arbitrary function f, compute for me f of some data that you have, some data that you have access to out in the world. And again, the pattern here is I'm gonna go to all these data providers, these silos, these services, and I might say, please respond for me. And there's two cases for what might happen after that. The first thing that could happen is they might go, you know, this is the happy path. They might go, here's what you need to know about Gubsheep. Here's like the response to your query. Um, but the sad path is that for one of many reasons, they might not be able to respond to this query. They might say, that API does not exist. Operation not allowed. Or that data is split amongst 10 providers who don't have a licensing agreement or a trust model between them. And, you know, I, I think it's a reasonable bet to make that 90% of the queries that human civilization could possibly care about making to each other uh, are gonna fall in their, this, this bucket. Um, and even the happy path is not so great. Okay, so what does the world with programmable cryptography look like? Well, it's a lot simpler. The person on the right asks, are you Gubsheep? And the person on the left says yes. And that's basically it. Um, the overhead that you have to incur is that the person on the left does have to generate some cryptographic artifact. Um, and, but by incurring this overhead, we sort of like increase the overall simplicity and composability of the system. And you know, we've got Zuck over in the bottom left making some sad Zuck noises. Okay, so here is a kind of uh, interaction that anyone who registered for a ticket to Prague Crypto probably had to go through with ZooPass. The person on the right said, are you a Prague Crypto attendee? Person on the left says yes, and provides, provides some sort of cryptography. Here we see that the cryptography also has these nice properties where there's minimal disclosure. Um, the person on the left is just responding to the query that the person on the right is asking. Um, and again, it's a much simpler system. We're not going through you know, such and such API or so and so you know, developer platform or whatever else. Um, with a more complex example, such as what's your credit score, the person on the left might gather their own data you know, from a bunch of various different sources and then be able to just generate a response alongside a cryptographic artifact that proves, hey, I gathered data from the appropriate sources, I ran this financial model on them fairly, and this is the answer to your query. So all of these are instances, again, of the general problem. The person on the right says, um, here's an arbitrary query. We can sort of like take that down one step uh, into mathematical formalization of like for an arbitrary f, compute for me f of some of this data that you have. Um, I might intake a bunch of my data from all these different sources, such as the blockchain, or from emails, or from any other, you know, data providers, and I can provide an answer, so long as I'm willing to accept a little bit of cryptographic performance overhead. 
This also is not just a pattern that humans have access to, machines have access to this as well, and it's interesting to kind of ponder the future of what kind of internet services might exist in a world where communication can actually just be directly between the two parties involved. Okay, so there's various kinds of programmable protocol technologies. Um, ZK SNARKs are the one that we know and love. Uh, there's also things like private information retrieval, various kinds of programmable encryption as we've discussed. Um, but this sort of technology is well on its way. You know, we see data sources of like making proofs about stuff on one blockchain and you know, verifying them on another blockchain or making proofs of something in the world and verifying them on a blockchain. Um, so yeah, these also don't have to be machines. They can also be things like smart contracts or whatever you want. Okay. So my second example of the sort of thing programmable cryptography allows you to do is this idea of collective hallucinations. So uh, my friend Justin sent me this essay a while back that actually really caught me off guard. It was an essay written by Nick Szabo more than 25 years ago called The God Protocols, where he basically speculates on like what might be possible in a world with programmable cryptography. And this is crazy to me because this was like 25 years ago. So in this uh, essay, he has these two diagrams. The first is the architecture of web services during the internet of his time, which, spoiler alert, looks a lot like the internet of our time. Um, you have some mutually trusted party that is required to run services like a social media backend, or a game backend, or a financial network, or various kinds of things. And then you've got clients who are sending their secrets to this mutually trusted party who's doing some sort of operations on them and then returning everyone the result. And the world that Nick Szabo kind of envisions is this one where these people who are trying to jointly perform some kind of operation or create some kind of application that is multiplayer between them might instead instantiate and summon into being a mutually trusted virtual computer using cryptography. So instead of actually having to have a corporal manifestation of this service provider, these people just simply decide what is the system that they want to use and because of programmable cryptography, they're able to just instantiate it into the world. Um, so this looks a lot like our internet today. You know, we've got things like social media sites uh, or financial networks or professional networks or whatever else where the, there is an actual custodian of that service that is like corporally manifested. And each of us has to talk to that custodian. Um, but with programmable cryptography, we could imagine a world where instead we collectively hallucinate those kinds of services. So we can sort of on demand decide like we want this kind of a new service and we like all collectively dream it together. Um, the thing that programmable cryptography gives us here is that that thing that we collectively hallucinate, we're sure is the same thing between all of us. All of us are hallucinating the same exact reality there. And that reality is progressing in accordance with the rules that we've agreed upon at the very beginning. So there's a lot of col collective hallucination technologies that are also ongoing. The one that we're probably the most familiar with is programmable blockchains, but there's also two-party computation as well as its generalization. All right, so uh, I want to finish up with some notes on how we might see the space evolve, how we might achieve this sort of thing. Well, that's really what this conference is intended to help seed. The underlying technology is improving rapidly. The infrastructure and libraries and tooling for actually making these technologies accessible to builders is also improving rapidly. While ZK SNARKs currently lead the pack, they're far from the only thing that is necessary to instantiate this world of programmable cryptography. Um, one interesting lens to view the uh, trajectory of this science through is to look at some of the performance curves. So these are, I'm, I'm gonna show some slides that I stole from my friend Nolan, um, but this is a table of sort of at the cutting edge of what is in production, how big are the biggest ZK circuits that we currently have accessible. Um, circuit size is basically this measure or constraint number is what that number is in that circuit size row and that's an approximate measure of like the complexity uh, of these circuits and what we're able to practically do. So you're sort of seeing that every four years there's been this jump of 32x over sort of like the, the history of SNARK so far. And uh, this is something that's outpacing Moore's law in addition to being something that benefits from Moore's law so we can expect to see a lot of gains uh, continue. Another interesting kind of trajectory to look at is the accessible performance trajectory of ZK 
and of programmable cryptography broadly. So, you know, one might ask the question, what is the size of circuits that two undergrads in a garage can write and use in a couple of weeks? Um, fortunately, we have empirical data on this because what we essentially do every year is we take a bunch of undergrads and put them in a metaphorical garage and have them, like, build stuff for a week or two. In 2019, um, me and a friend built Dark Forest, uh, which was a circuit that involved about 2,000 constraints. Um, we had a student in 2021 build a ZK linear regression demo. Uh, that got us up to about 100,000. We had some folks build Stealth Drop, a private ECDSA airdrop service um, that got up to 10 million constraints. And earlier this year, we saw some folks put uh, deep neural networks into folding schemes uh, and achieve a billion constraints, uh, generating a proof of a billion constraints. Now, the circuit size here is a very rough proxy for complex, uh, complexity and usability. It's not really an exact measure, but one reason it might be a good proxy is because in order for us to make use of larger and larger circuit sizes, performance has to improve, tooling has to improve, we're probably working with libraries that abstract more uh, complex operations over time, and it's an approximate, you know, proxy here. Um, if you, like, squint your eyes and extrapolate this, you start seeing something that looks like 64x every year. Uh, I think this number is very much to be taken, you know, not literally, maybe take seriously, not literally. Um, we don't think that this will like continue indefinitely, but the point here is that stuff's improving really, really fast. And of course, there's similar sort of performance curves that you can measure for all those other kinds of branches of programmable cryptography, um, but ZK might be the one that is most present to us today in this room, um, as uh, folks in the ecosystem might know about. A final lens that I like thinking about is this question that actually Barry posed a while back of how programmable really is programmable cryptography? And to do this again, I'm going to take ZK as an example, because I think that's particularly present today. Um, in my head, there's a sort of hierarchy of programmability for zero knowledge, in which there's about four stages. The first is stage one is this thing is theoretically possible. Stage two is there exist circuit languages. Stage three is there exist program to circuit compilers. And stage four means you know, there's ZK VMs and all sorts of uh, useful tooling for recursion and composition. So, in stage one, programmable cryptography theoretically exists, but it's not actually, in practice, very programmable at all. There might exist a paper, but there's no library implementations. So in practice, if you want to build a zero-knowledge-based application, you first have to write that entire library uh, with that ZK-SNARK meta protocol to write your one specific circuit that you're going to run through that protocol um, to build your one specific application. And so in practice, while programmable cryptography theoretically should allow ordinary people to use cryptography. Uh, you, you basically have to be a cryptographer because you have to write the library yourself. In stage two, we have circuit languages. Th these are things like CIRCOM. So in this world, someone has actually written the library and they've written like a specific bespoke layer for cryptography-aware developers to specify those kinds of transformations that they want to compile down into protocols. Um, but you still need to be pretty cryptography-aware to use this stuff. Uh, these languages allow you to build circuits, which is a programming paradigm that is specific to the cryptographic regime that you're operating in. We might be approaching now stage three, which is this idea of program to circuit compilers, where I don't have to be super cryptography aware in order to make use of programmable cryptography. I might be able to write my uh, high-level specification in a language and a paradigm that I'm familiar with. So, for example, this is a screenshot from an Ezekiel Python notebook. Um, and there's automatically a tool chain that will take that and compile it into a circuit for me. And then finally, you've got this fourth stage of ZKVMs, recursion composition, where my runtime is something that I'm familiar with, where I'm able to very flexibly move things around and join them together in a way that I, as an ordinary programmer, um, might have the entire cryptographic stack abstracted away from myself. So that's ZK. Um, there's obviously plenty of other technologies as well. Uh, 2PC, which we'll hear about later from Barry, is probably just straddling the line between stage one and stage two. And other technologies are at stage one, where they're theoretically possible, um, or even stage, stage zero, where they're theoretically plausible, but we don't even really know if they're possible yet. We just think that there's strong evidence for that. The takeaway here is that there's still orders of magnitude left for each technology in the tech tree. This is sort of a grand civilizational scale science and engineering quest, uh, and it's something that we're just beginning to embark on. And with that, I sort of want to conclude and close out with a thought on the last 50 years of cryptography and the next 50 years. 
So if we look at this tech tree, a lot of the last 50 years, and we're really approaching actually the eve of the 50th anniversary of uh, the first discovery of the RSA crypto system, a lot of the last 50 years was really about taking the idea of cryptographic hardness at all and bringing it into the world and understanding its implications. And it's taken us 50 years to get to a point where cryptography is widely deployed um, on every device, every computing device that's connected to the internet. What might the next 50 years bring? Well, we're again approaching this era where we do have these tools for programmable cryptography and we're just starting to understand their implications. It will take a long time to realize them. It will take a long time and a major collective effort to advance the scientific agenda as well of this field. But who knows, you know, just like ZK Snarks and the idea of everyone having or every digital service having a public private key was probably a pipe dream 50 years ago. In the same way, I think we might be surprised by where cryptography is and how it's impacting us 50 years from now. Thank you. Thanks, Gubsheep.